Thank you for joining The Real News for the second part of the interview with Ta-Nehisi Coates uh, in which he will talk about reparation. You're, you're not a youth anymore, of course I am <laughs> like approaching 70. <laughs> uh, but, you know, young people read your stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and even people a little older, uh, like my son is 50 and mm -hmm. he just follows everything you write, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and other people, people all over the country actually mm -hmm. read and follow your stuff. How do you see America today? I mean, I know you just wrote that piece of reparation. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I guess one, give me a reason, give me, explain to me why you felt the need to write that. It seems like we've been talking about reparation for like hundreds of years from from one great person to the next yeah uh, but it seemed to me that that particular article that you wrote kind of resonated across the nation and why why did you write it and why do you think it was so accepted well i wrote it because it became clear to me like through you know reading and through study that it, it, it actually was the answer you know now they're two separate things it's like do does the society have a political courage and a moral courage to do what's right? And that's one thing. And then it's actually identifying what's right. So you can identify what's actually right, and the society might not do it. The way this country has worked for the vast majority of its history, you know, and you know, I, I would say to you know, to some extent, even today, is African Americans have functioned as a class of people who things were taken from to enrich other people, and. When you do that, you know, there tend to be some effects. And the way to remedy that is to A, stop doing that, but to also, you know, give back, to, to you know, pay down that debt, to get that to somewhere, you know, where folks can be whole again. Without that, I, I don't expect much to change. Um, and I mean, like, if, you're, if your great concern is ending, you know, any sort of gap, any sort of chasm between black and white folks, which is to say ending, you know, white supremacy, um, I, I don't see it happening any other way. And so that was why I wrote it. To the extent it resonates, I think it's because deep inside people know that, mm -hmm. even if they don't want to admit it. I think they know. I think they, I think they know that it's correct, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I don't mean like they know that I'm correct, because I didn't come, you know, as you said, I just been around for hundreds, literally hundreds of years, literally hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, first person that we have claiming for reparations in my article uh, claimed it in like 1787 or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so I, I think we know that it's correct. You know, it's just can we, you know, muster the courage was that to do it? Woman? It's a woman, yeah. Her name was yeah. Belinda. I came up her last yeah. name, yeah. but yeah, it was a woman. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh huh. And her argument was, her master had been a British, was a British loyalist, and after the war, he had gotten Belinda Royal was her name, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he had gotten rich. You know, basically, you know, through exploiting her labor. And she said, well, you know, and the Massachusetts legislature had taken over this man's property because he had fled to England. And she said, listen. A lot of that probably is actually rightfully mine, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Because that's how he got it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and what they did was they actually set up, um, they used some portion of the property to set up a pension plan to take care of her. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think we know, I think we know. I think we know it's right. Mm -hmm. Do you think America has the will to do what's right, though? Not right now, no. No, but I mean, I think part of the long-term fight to get that will is um, reminding people of what the right thing is. I mean, I, you know, frankly, I mean, to me, like, I just take it back to your case. So in my mind, it's like, oh, brother, he's never gonna get out. You know what I mean? Like, and it must have been people who, you know, had worked on the case who just succumbed to despair. Now, you didn't have that option, you know what I mean? But there must have been people, and I, and I imagine you saw this in prison where other people are, are fighting something, and they just succumb, I'm never getting out. I'm never getting out. So I, I think like with any sort of struggle, it's like, like despair is the thing you, you, know, you really have to avoid. You know, and yes, it's a long fight. It's a long fight. I mean, and, and I think in the case for reparations, it's a long like generations, a fight through generations. You know, it's not like something that you necessarily expect to be resolved in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. You know, but you do your part and you know, give what you can. There seems to be right now uh, a concern, an interest, uh, Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, we have the Freddie Gray uh, situation here, mm -hmm. the Michael Brown in Ferguson, mm -hmm. the Ghana up in New York, the uh, Oscars out in mm -hmm. uh, Oakland, mm -hmm, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just have a litany of uh, sisters uh, uh, up in uh, Detroit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, 
uh, just recently, and this is not even big news, a sister down in Atlanta, Georgia, was mm. shot in the back of the mm. police mm-hmm. car, mm-hmm. Uh, handcuffed. Uh, uh, so there seems to be a, a new awakening or awareness of young people and a concern and an interest about, you know, what they can do, you mm-hmm. know, an interest in how to do something to make mm-hmm. changes. Mm-hmm. And since you are not that far removed from that generation, what would you suggest that young people do at this point? You know, I, I think it's like really, really important to seize control of your own education. Mm-hmm. I think it's just so, so important. I think you cannot leave your education up to schools, to universities. I think it's very, very important for, the, for you to read for yourself mm-hmm. and try to come to like as, as precise an understanding as you can. And that's always evolving, of course, for your whole mm-hmm. life. But mm-hmm. as precise to understand as you can as the of the country you live in, you know, and the space which you occupy. You know, because you can't really begin to identify correct solutions if you don't do that. And just to give an example of that, like in this like Black Lives Matter movement, I mean, one of the things that people, some people, you know, talk about, especially politicians, is this idea of of, of body cameras. Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, I'm for body cameras, but. It, it helps you to a, avoid a deeper discussion mm-hmm. about why police are, you know, in certain neighborhoods and why they're not in other neighborhoods. Why police are acting a certain way in certain neighborhoods and not acting that way in another neighborhood. And you know, like, well, people say, well, the police are there because of crime. Well, why is the crime there? Mm-hmm. Like, what's what's really like? What's actually going on? Mm-hmm. You know, wh- or do you want to live in a society where, because say somebody like Freddie Gray happens to be in an area, you know, where folks have identified as high drug activity, looks at somebody in a way that I guess he wasn't supposed to, and the police run him down. Mm-hmm. You know, like, and, and by police, I mean, I think it's very important to identify, like, people who are serving to the state. The state has empowered them to kill people, mm-hmm. okay? Um, so that means it's done in all of our names, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's done in the name of, of, of all citizens. Is that how you want, you know, people acting in your name? Is that the, like the sort of society? And body cameras can't fix that. You know, body cameras can't fix, like, you know, you just ran through this list, litany of people who got killed. If you look at these issues, a lot of times beneath this is other issues, mental health issues, you know, issues around employment, issues around how we deal with, like, child support. That's the Walter Scott case. All sorts of other things where we could make other decisions as a society. I think the simplistic focus on the, on the police is, is, is a problem. Mm-hmm. You know, but you can only get there through study. So I think, like, really, I mean, it sounds passive, but I don't think it is. I'm, I'm a big fan of reading. <laughs> I'm a huge, mm-hmm. huge fan of reading. I really am. What I notice, unfortunately, and it's been pointed out uh, to me by, like, sisters, is that there is a lot of male talking heads yeah, they are. <laughs> talking about, you know, the amount of black men that's killed. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, um, you know, mic, I guess, the hugging the mic mm-hmm. kind of thing, mm-hmm. and, and leaders. And, <laughs> and from my experience with the Black Panther Party uh, almost 50 years ago, mm-hmm. it's like we wouldn't have had a successful movement, even though it was attacked by the government, but we wouldn't have had uh, even that. Uh, activity in an organized, sophisticated way if it hadn't been for sisters. Mm-hmm. Sisters on the ground, sisters in the middle ranks, sisters in leadership. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I wonder why it seems to me now that sisters seem to be invisible. I think a lot of the times, so being shot by a police officer is a, is a, it's a broad sensationalist sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, in a way that child can equal pay is not. You know what I mean? Like, it's mm-hmm. like, like a part of this is, even though I'm saying this is we're talking on film, <laughs> part of this is like the bias of, of, of a camera and like drama. Mm-hmm. You know, so like you, you got the video of Freddie Gray and that looks horrible. You know what I mean? You got a video of Walter Scott and, and that looks horrible. Um, and I think a lot of the issues that are equally important and in some cases more important, you know, that's what I was trying to talk about, like these sort of root issues. Mm-hmm. Um, do not lend themselves to the short attention spans of a lot of people. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's, that's, that's the fact of it. Um, 
Now, what you were saying about talking heads, it's actually, in fact, one of the reasons or, like, part of the reason why, again, even though we're doing this right now, like, my people at The Atlantic, there's always tension. <laughs> I try to stay off camera. I, I really do. I really do. Because, I, God forbid, you know, I become perceived in that sort of way. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I feel that, like, I have a very, very limited role. Mm -hmm. And my limited role is to be a writer. My limited role is to write things. I'm not an activist. I, you know, obviously support, you know, and have great love for activists. But that's not particularly, you know, my role. That's, you know, that's another aspect of the fight for other people to take up. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I try to, you know, really, really guard that. I, I don't want to be seen in any way as, you know, somebody that's sort of hugging the mic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I write in my space. Mm -hmm. and then what happen, happens outside of that, you know, is, is it's for other folks to deal with. There's, there's always this dual discussion about Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. In the first place, I think that's a movement that was started by sisters, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, but there's this discussion about if Black Lives Matter, why is there so much fraternicide in the black yeah. community? Uh, and uh, bodies are dropping right and left and you don't hear the same kind of outcry that you hear in relationship to the, I guess it, it boils down to several hundred a year yeah. uh, by the police right. as opposed to uh, several thousand, and I'm talking maybe up into the, the tens, uh, but not yeah. much more than that, uh, by our own internal violence. Yeah. Again, there's like the spectacle of a police officer doing something. That's the kind of direct violence, right? But there's the indirect violence that form neighborhoods like the one we're sitting in now, and that is where people pass certain laws and say, well, you have to live in this sort of area. You know what I mean? Which is, you know, how, like, these neighborhoods were formed. How, you know, where Freddie Gray was, how it was formed. You know, it's not like, I mean, you grew up here. You couldn't live wherever you wanted. Am I right about that? All right. Like, you couldn't just move. I mean, there must be certain areas that you, you must remember yeah. that you, you couldn't just go up and buy a house there. Oh, certainly. You know? Not far from here, we couldn't right. live. Right, yeah. right, right. And so, when, when you have, and, 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 and the reasons for that, as I talk about in the case for reparations, are not like, uh, they, they did not come, you know, out of the ether or down from God. I mean, there were federal, federal policies that said certain people were going to live in certain places or we're going to invest in certain places, you know, in certain ways. And that, you know, continues even in, 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 into today. And I don't mean necessarily even the discrimination, the, the effects of it, of restricting where folks live and how they live and the amount of resources and who's going to have jobs and where they're going to have jobs. Um, if you concentrate people who do not have much, who have very, very little wealth, into one area. If you restrict their movement out, 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 outside of that area, and if you compound this over generations, if you have the backstory on top of that, of, of, of the sheer you know, violence of, of slavery, which is effectively a system of torture for profit, you had a sheer violence of the entire Jim Crow era, 100 years of that after, after enslavement, and you pile that up, I don't know what people expect to happen after that. I, I don't like like I don't know why people then expect for all of that to happen and for there to be no violence within the communities. Behind each one of those actions that I identify, housing policy, Jim Crow, and we ain't even covering the whole gambit, uh, enslavement, um, job discrimination, in all of those places you can find the hands of federal, state, and local policy shaping things. Um, that is violence. Mm -hmm. That's violence. That's violence. You know, it's not the graphic violence or the spectacular violence of a police officer shooting somebody down. Mm -hmm. But that is violence because what's behind every one of those laws is do this or you will be arrested. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Like violence, yeah. the implicit threat yeah. is behind yeah. e e every single one of those. And so the kind of violence that we see in African-American neighborhoods, you know, is the indirect result is the indirect result, I shouldn't say indirect, is the direct result mm -hmm. of policy. Now, it, it doesn't matter that the guy who, you know, is holding the gun, you know, is a police officer or is just somebody from the neighborhood. And I maintain that even about, like, the police killers. I've said this about, it's the same thing. The police killers are not simply about, are not, I wouldn't say simply, are not even about whether the police are bad people or not. Mm -hmm. You know, and they certainly are not simply about whether, you know, police respect the neighborhoods you know, in which they're policing. That's an aspect of it. But the bigger question is, who is sending them there? What's the policy behind it? Mm -hmm. And it's the exact same thing out here. It's the exact same thing out in the neighborhood. I mean, it's like, what is the policy that allows this to happen? 
What's behind? So I, I just I, I've never seen you know much difference between the two things. Mm-hmm. You know I, I just I just don't. It's certainly true that when I was here, the people who I most feared violence from, you know, people down on North Avenue, people up on Park Heights, you know, people who came from Gilmore Homes who went to Lamel. I mean that was yes, that's who I feared the most violence from. But what was the policy behind that? What was driving that? Like, see, that, that to me is, is the real question. I mean, when you get caught up in this sort of individuals, you know, and, and, you know, even like, again, going back to Freddie Gray, you know, like we can all applaud for those, you know, cops being charged and everything and indicted. But is there going to be actual policy change in how that community is policed? Is there going to be actual policy change so that, like, when we went down there yesterday, you know, folks are just sort of out there, you know, with no sense of employment, education. Is there going to be actual policy change? You know, you, you, we focus too much on, on, on the particulars of, 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 of the police um, or the people doing the violence, in the hand of the violence, mm-hmm. as opposed to the body that's actually directing the violence and what it's trying to do. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Eddie. Thank you so much, <laughs> man. Thank okay. you. Thank you. All right. Thank you for joining us for this exclusive interview with Tanahisi Coates, and thank you for joining The Real News.